All right, welcome to a special edition of the Zero Technique Football Podcast brought to you by www.backsportspage.com. I'm your host, Ryan Stern, and joining me today is former legendary New York Giants tight end and current sideline reporter for the Giants radio network, Howard Cross. Howard, thank you for joining us, and I hope you and your family have been healthy throughout these uh, past couple crazy months. <laughs> yeah, we've been pretty healthy, thank God. You know, My son's off at school already, been there since June, and my daughter left yesterday. Yeah, I know uh, your son is uh, over at Notre Dame. And uh, a- any word on whether or not he's uh, going to be getting any uh, playing time? And, and I know Notre Dame right now, uh, it looks like they're going to be joining the ACC for uh, for this year because everyone's sticking to conference play. Well, you know, Notre Dame's been you know, taking advantage of the ideal with the NBC, and they've made a lot of money with it. But it- – as an independent, it, this is a really unique situation. They're going to have to do something. Uh, as far as he goes, you know, he played uh, the four games last year to keep his red shirt. Right. Uh, so after that, I think he had like eight to 14 tackles or something in those games from a defensive tackle position. So I'm assuming that if they put him in more games, he'll make a lot more yeah. plays. So it should be pretty good. All right. Well, uh, you played the, the third most games played in New York Giants franchise history. Now, first of all, what do you attribute uh, the most to your longevity? And second, what does it mean to you to be that high on the list for this historic franchise? No, it's pretty cool. You know, uh, very healthy, very blessed. You know, uh, durability and availability is what makes you stay in there for so long. I don't think that the world's changed. The world has changed a lot when it comes down to guys and playing, you know, more Knicks and and Knox now, and they, they, they need to take off and get a rest where we were opposed to anything. We'd played an entire preseason game to keep guys off the field if we could just because you wanted to play so bad. Uh, like, it, was just, it was just different, the different mentality. Uh, guys, uh, they're negotiating now. To, they negotiated away the preseason games for the during this pandemic when we were playing. We'd have been like, okay, we'll, we'll got to get the preseason so we can get our spots. So it was just just different. Uh, that's that's one thing, and and you know, be behind Strahan directly, and then Eli just means you just you just been at it for a long time. It works out a lot. Uh, yeah, and what, now when your career ended, you decided to make the move into broadcasting. Now, did you know during your career that media was in your future after retirement? Not at all. Not at all. I think I think some agents that saw me uh, doing some auctions and doing stand up kind of goofing off. And they're like, dude, you, you'd be great on TV. And I started laughing. I'm like, yeah, sure. Whatever you want. I'll, I'll try it. And from there, I've, I've done a lot of different things, whether it be ESPN, Fox, CBS, NBC, of course, with the with the Giants and just uh, different shows. It's been it's been a lot of fun. Um, I know you uh, work with the Giants radio network and you get to team up with Bob Papa and Carl Banks. And from just a pure football standpoint, I, I don't see any team in in the NFL that has so much knowledge and so much, I guess, experience that, that the three of you bring. And the, the bits of nuggets of information that the three of you bring to a broadcast is one of a kind. Uh, tell me about the, the relationship that the three of you have. Oh, we're all good buddies. So, uh, Bob, Carl, and we have a great time together. Uh, we do, uh, Bob does an incredible amount of research, you know, uh, knows everything you can possibly know about the players. He's there basically every day, um, which is, which is, you know, remarkable when he's doing so many different things in his, in his broadcast career, Carl, uh, really focuses in on, on different players and, and tries to pull together special thoughts during the week. And me, of course, I'm on the sideline getting to watch the guys and, and pay attention to the day to day grind that they have and see how it translates back to the field. So it's, you know, after playing for the team and being invested in the team because we are, you know, giant once giants, always giants, mm-hmm. it makes it a lot easier to, to focus on, you know, outside of your college. It's, it's very easy to focus on what's going on with these guys. Now, you, you mentioned once a giant, always a giant, and you, you hear it from pretty much anyone that, that leaves the organization. What is it about the New York Giants franchise that it, it just means so much to so many uh, people to, to get to put on that jersey? 
Well, you know, if, if you think about it, I know there's two ownerships in the family, the Tishes and the Maris, but when you go back to the Mara family, they were, they're so uh, deeply intertwined and, and involved with it, not just as owners, but they actually love and, and, and respect the team. And, you know, Wellington, especially if you look back at some of the things he did in his life and how he even you know, wrote about him when he was writing home from the war, he wrote about the Giants, that they really, really love and respect the, the organization and the team. And now with John and, and even Steve and John uh, Tish also uh, all working together, that those their dads kind of like pass on that love and that affection for it. And all the kids are working for the, that are working for the team show the same thing. And all the grandkids that are maybe involved with the team show the same kind of love for it. Yeah. All right, so uh, let's shift our attention to the current team. And it seems that this is the worst time to be instilling a, a new coaching staff in both offensive and defensive playbooks because of the limited on-field work they're going to be allowed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, how much of an impact do you think it'll be on the team, especially earlier on in the season when they do have uh, a, a pretty daunting uh, first couple games? I have no idea. I, mean, I, I would tell you there would be something specific, but there's no idea. This has never happened in, in my lifetime before. So uh, not being able to have access to your teammates, to your coaches, to all the plays, it's, it's impossible to know what, what the actual impact is going to be and you know how widespread it will be. You'll have some teams that are veteran teams, veteran coaches. They've been with the same system for a long time. Uh, which that's you would think that would work, but you always have new players coming in. You always have free agents stepping on the field. You always have draft picks, and you always got guys that you're trying to bring along to get them ready to play. If you're not around them, no one knows what what, what you know what true effect that's going to have. You know, most of their meetings and conversations have been Zoom calls, so yeah. it's been that's been the whole thing. How many guys can absorb it? Uh, well, that, as technical as it could be sometimes, how many guys can absorb it from a Zoom call is going to be a very great experiment for the entire league. Yeah, and uh, I mean, this is also the, the first time since 2003 that Eli Manning won't be in the building for the Giants. Mm -hmm. The job now belongs to Daniel Jones. Uh, how much of the leadership role do you think he learned from Eli last year? And do you think he's ready from a leadership standpoint to put this team on his back? Uh, I'd hope he would be, but you know, I don't think guys realize how great Eli actually was. I hear a lot of people criticizing and, and trying to figure it out. The guy did a pretty remarkable job, one of the top 10 passers, touchdowns, uh, you know, two Super Bowl MVPs, carried the team a few years in, into the playoffs uh, before the defense steps up and helps them win the game. Um, so that's hard to, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? It's hard to duplicate. And the fact that he never missed a game, uh, he, he took a lot of beating, a lot of pounding, never complained, never threw anybody under the bus, uh, never said anything other than, okay, let's go. You know, it's my fault. Uh, you know, the team wins. He gave very someone else the credit. Just true gentleman. The kid, the kid did a great job. Uh, and do you think Daniel Jones is ready to uh, to take that leap into leadership and and making sure that he can be a franchise quarterback for this team in, in the present and the future. Well, you know, if he just follows Eli's example, it, it wouldn't be much of a leadership kind of role as we, as we do in sports, try to make the voice boisterous guy, the guy that's going to be standing out front screaming and yelling. That wasn't Eli. Right. <laughs> so Eli just showed up, uh, made sure everybody was around quietly, did what he needed to do to get it, get it done. And like I said, you know, kept the focus on him in defeats and off of him in victories. If if he can just follow those that path, then yeah, he's he's the perfect leader. If he's supposed to be the guys out there cheering and jumping and yelling, that'd be interesting to see if that's him do that too. So it's gonna be he wasn't like that in college. So he and he wasn't like that last year, even though he was a rookie. We'll we'll see how he steps in and, and takes on some role. You know, I've seen some promos and some ads with the team and hear his voice talk or doing his voiceover. So I'm sure he's already stepping into that role very nicely. All right. Now, uh, you were known as one of the best blocking tight ends, uh, I know, in Giants history, but in my opinion, in NFL history. The Giants do have uh, a, their primary tight end who is not necessarily known as a blocker. Uh, do you think that Evan Ingram has the ability to add that to his game and uh, – 
do you think that if he does add that to his game, will it take away from the explosiveness that he has as a pass catcher? No, I, th- I think, you know, Evan will tell you, like, you know, his main his main need is to be available. Uh, I think he, right. he knows that he's been banged up a lot, and it's not always something you can avoid. It's something, something you can fix immediately, but his availability is what he needs. Uh, uh, he could be like uh, back in the day, Jay Novacek or, or Jordan up in Minnesota, catch a lot of balls and just get in the way of the guys on the backside. That's a good block just getting in the way. So that doesn't really have to be. He doesn't have to be the dominating, knock you off the ball guys uh, that, that we were in, the, in our day. But he can, you know, get in the way and make that part of his game. I think he'll he'll be okay. But the biggest biggest issue he has is his health. So he needs to be able to, you know, Maybe get a you know four leaf clover or something and put it in his sock because he needs to stay healthy as long as he possibly can. Uh, one more for you, and that's it's going to be on the defensive side of the ball. Mm-hmm. And this is a, this is a team that hasn't really done much on the defensive side of the ball over the past couple of years. They haven't been able to establish an identity. Uh, they now bring in new coaching staff, new game plan. It looks like they're going to be more hybrid as opposed to a strict 3-4 or 4-3. Does this personnel have what it takes to ju- uh, maybe even not not to get into the top five or top 10, but to be a, an average defense? Because I think that's where they need to look for for this year. They, they can't worry about being a dominating defense, but just to be an okay defense, a, a middle of the road. Well, you know, you have to have guys on all three levels when you're playing defense. Uh, and you need like one one guy in each position. You need one good D tackle that that creates uh, havoc for the entire offense when somebody's getting pushed up the middle. If you can figure that out with Tomlinson uh, and 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 Big Boy up there, that could work out for you. With get one of those two of those one of those guys or both of those guys pushing the middle, it helps. You need a defensive end that can rush. Um, you had Davis last year do some do some good things, but you need one more guy that can actually bring pressure off the edge. You, of course, you do need linebackers, and, and in a three four, if that's what they want to run in a hybrid series, those guys actually rush the passer too. So and and dropping the coverage, so you got to figure that out. Uh, do they have the personnel for that? Like it's, they have to figure it out. That's what they're you know that's what they're saying they're going to do. And, and then most importantly, you have to have cover guys. And right now. Uh, you have one safety that looks like he could could get to the Pro Bowl, and you have the other kid who's trying. Uh, you have two cornerbacks uh, that they're they're both young and they're trying to figure it out as they go. All these guys have got to step up. So what you're asking for is if you can't get pressure on the quarterback and you need to get pressure on him, there needs to be very tight coverage in the back to get make him hold the ball for one more step, or one more one more click, or one more second. If you can't get that. And then you're going you're going to have some long days, um, and I think the tackling will pick up uh, because of just you know younger guys with you know one more step figuring out the pace of the game. But the ideal is to be able to stay close, and these receivers are getting better and better every year. And it's not the rules; they're just getting better and better every year. Right. So the DBs got to get better and better every year, and they got to stay close to them. The Giants probably going to be without Baker uh, for for a little bit. Uh, and if they're without him, they got to figure out and patch a couple holes in the secondary. Their secondary will, quote unquote, determine how well they do for the rest of the year. Now, with Nate Solder opting out, it does open up mm-hmm. some salary cap uh, space. And Jadavian Clowney is still out on the market. Is And we all, I think Jadavian Clowney could fit into any scheme. But do you think that he's the type of player that if the giants feel they they're willing to make the investment can be just that difference maker on on the, in this group from day one. Well, one, I think you have to think about when Nate, Nate is a predisposed. So I think he get an accrued year towards his contract. So I don't know if he has two more years left or what. So, but he, he opts out on, on the idea that he, you know, He's at risk, so right. that's one thing. So I don't know how that really affects uh, the way the owners spend money. I'm assuming they're they've. I think the union and the ownership did it where they could actually sign free agents without paying the guys whatever their enormous salaries would be at that you know at that moment. As far as your Navy Clowney goes, uh, I think he's a you know pretty good player, very you know explosive, long, rangy, can do a lot of different things. Uh, has he done enough in the league to? 
to warrant a huge contract? That I don't know. That's one of those things where you're signing them on speculation that you, you're you're just, you're hoping that he's going to be a long term, you know, great player that like he had stints here and there. And remember, he was playing opposite JJ Watt, so a lot of attention was on JJ Watt. And when JJ wasn't in there, Clowney played okay, but he wasn't the most dominant player on the field. Howard, want to thank you for uh, giving us some of your time today mm-hmm. and uh, want wish uh, best health to you and your family. Uh, best of luck to your son over at Notre Dame. Go Irish. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and look forward to talking to you in the future. All right. I appreciate it. You have a great one. Thanks.